Welcome to lecture 6a, quality of service of network on chip and caches in TCMP systems. Over the last few weeks, we were trying to understand about how a processor work and how the memory hierarchy work and what is the correlation between them and how they coordinate each other and then we have also learned about the concepts of network on chip. In modern multi-core systems, basically known as tiled chip multi-core systems, we have multiple processors, these are organized as tiles inside a chip. Now we know that for an efficient coordination, these shared resources like caches, your L1, L2 caches, as well as the network on chip and the memory controller has to work in a coordinated fashion to achieve better throughput and performance. Ultimately, for users working on these TCMP system, the quality of service depends upon how these shared resources are utilized in the best possible way. In this lecture video, our focus is on how can cache talk to NOC and how can NOC talk back to cache such that if there exists an efficient communication between them, a proper handshaking between the network on chip and caches, how can you get a quality of service at the end? So, we have already seen that tiled chip multi-core processors are there and we are having many such uh, chips and each of these chip is going to have a core which consists of the decoders, the branch prediction, the schedulers, the execution unit, the memory management unit, all these things are there. And we have memory controllers also, multiple memory controllers on the chip. So our future is going to be with these kind of chips. And one such very prominent chip is known as the Intel KNL, it's called Intel Knight's Landing Processor, it's also known as Intel Xeon Phi, which has total of 36 tiles organized as two dimensional mesh. So you can see that it is six cross six, six row wise and six column wise. And each of this tile you have two cores and uh, it's basically two virtual processing unit per core. So altogether four virtual processing unit is there per core. You have one MB of L2 cache that is per core and eight channels of DDR4 memory controller. So you can see that these are all the memory controllers that are there on the both side. This is a very uh, common TCMP, tiled chip multi-core processor that, are, that is there in the market. Similarly, future multi-core processors are going to be of the order of this Xeon Phi processor what Intel has developed or something on a larger magnitude. Now let us try to understand the on-chip communication from the perspective of an application. So consider the case that you have an application that is going to be there and this application is uh, having some L1 hits and the application is working very fine. Now it got a L1 miss where you have to generate a packet into the network and uh, that is going to come like this. So what you see in the corner are basically memory controllers. You assume that there are four memory channels in this uh, particular TCMP. And it so happened that your application that we are talking about is going to have its L2 cache address that is mapped in this particular core. So there need to be an NOC packet that travel all the way from the source core into the L2 cache core using XY routing. So you can see that the packet move in X direction and then Y direction and then it is going to reply with the data. So this is the case how you are going to handle with an L1 miss which is essentially an L2 hit. There can be cases where you know that uh, sometimes you may not be able to get a data which is going to be a hit in L2. So in that case when it goes to L2 it comes to know that it is a miss in L2 then based on address mapping, you know that it is going to be connected to this memory controller or the data is physically present in that uh, portion of your main memory. So one more request is generated from the L2 tile into the main memory tile that is towards the corner. Data is returned back to L2. L2 is uh, completely filled with the data. That's a block is uh, transferred to L2 and from L2 it creates the reply packet. That is the order in which a data is created uh, is through the network. So you have a processing core that is going to generate a request as a cache memory packet into the L2 cache core and if it is a hit, this, this will take care of an L2 hit and if it is going to be a miss, then things will take little bit more time 
it goes to L2 and it goes to main memory and then it comes back to L2 and then only you are going to process. So that is the way how L1 misses are going to be handled from L2 and from main memory controller. Meaning depending on the address you may have to generate packets to various uh, tiles inside the chip. So for a different address it may be to a different portion inside the chip. So, this is how an on chip communication happens and your applications can be categorized as some applications are going to be light and some applications are going to be heavy. Let us try to understand what is this concept of light and heavy applications. An application is led to be light from the perspective of a network when the number of misses the application generate is rather less. When there is less number of cache misses that is the application is encountering that will lead to less number of packets meaning less traffic in the network. When application is going to generate more number of cache misses, it will pump in more packets into the NOC, we call such kind of applications are heavy applications. So the classification of an application into uh, light or heavy is based upon number of cache misses that uh, the application is going to have in a given unit of time or indirectly it is going to be the number of packets this application will trigger into the underlying network on chip. So, let us try to uh, revisit the concept of cache address mapping once again. So, consider the case that you have a TCMP where per core you have 512 KB of cache and 16 way associative. So, since it is 64 core totally I have 32 megabytes of L2 cache and this L2 cache is 16 way associative and 64 byte block and total we have uh, 4 GB of DRAM. So, total of 2 power 32 locations are there in the DRAM. So, the address, the physical address consists of 32 bits. This 32 bits are divided into 11, 15 and 6. That means, there are 2 power 15 sets and each set has 16 lines because it is 16 way associative and each of this line can accommodate 64 bytes of data that is what is called your black offset and the remaining is called your tag. So, for a different cache configuration, different size or different associativity of a cache, these numbers that is given to the tag, index and offset is going to change. So, this is an example we have seen in our previous lecture. Now, consider the case that uh, you are going to have an address. Let us say you are going to have an address uh, which is represented in the hexadecimal form. Now, this address when you do the split up, this is the way how these 32 bits are going to be split. The green portion indicates the tag bits and uh, the blue portion indicates the set. There are 2 power 15 sets. So, 15 bits are reserved for the set index and the last 6 bits are for the offset. Now, since the entire 2 power 15 set is scattered across 64 tiles, when we get an address in order to find out where the address is mapped, where the L2 is been mapped, we have to divide the address portion that is the set index portion into two components. Out of the 15 bits in the set, you are going to take the first 6 bit which will tell you which is the destination tile and the last 9 bit is going to tell you which is going to be the set within the tile. So, this shows that for a packet that is generated from this blue core that is shown in the TCMP, this particular address is mapped to the 44th core and the 44th core is being given by the red color spot. So, packet are generated from the blue core into the red one. Now, depending on a different address, let us say it is a different address rather than 0x764254. If it is a different address, then packet may be going from blue to different different tiles and some may be to nearby cores whereas some may be to the farther core. So, it is basically the cache address mapping that governs what is going to be the destination of a request packet. So, some packets will travel longer in the network when the address is mapped to those particular cores and some may, will tra some may be traveling relatively to smaller distance in the network. Let us try to see what is the role of memory controllers. We have told, already seen that memory controllers are there on chip and they generate appropriate timing and control signals for effective transfer of data from the memory controller into the DRAM device. Now, having set this background, let us try to understand how can you improve quality of service in a chip multi-core processor. 
So, today in, in this lecture, we are going to understand two such proposed works that are, that are published uh, in the recent computer architecture conferences from good research groups. So, I am going to discuss about those two published works and uh, many computer architecture so researchers are following these kind of works. So, uh, students who wanted to work further are uh, into these topics as we are moving to the end of uh, this course, only a couple of lectures left. Those who wanted to explore further, deeper or work on a thesis, maybe at masters or a doctoral level, then it is good to follow these kind of published works in this domain. So, with the background that we have about a fair idea of storage on chip and a fair idea of interconnect on chip, these papers will give you a better idea about how can you improve quality of service. So, we will try to look into the aspect of congestion management in on-chip interconnects. So, the first one is going to be slack aware routing and second one is called packet throttling. So, we have seen that network on-chip is a critical resource where multiple applications are going to run on these processors and these applications will trigger packets which are essentially cache misses which will travel through the network. So, NOC is a critical resource shared by multiple applications. Now, we have also seen that input and output channel selection. When you have multiple packets looking for the same output port, it is a scheduler or basically the switch allocator unit inside your NOC router that takes a call which of this packet has to be chosen. Similarly, when a packet has multiple output ports that is available, it is the adaptive routing function and the selection function that pick one of the output port uh, for this packet. So, in all these aspects, the adaptivity is going to be brought into picture. So, the conventional policies that we work on switch level scheduling is one is the round robin policy and the other one is age policy. So, I try to draw your attention into uh, a scenario. Consider the case that you have a packet P1 and you have a packet P2. Let us say both P1 and P2 reached the processor at the same time and both P1 and P2 wanted to go to the east direction. As per the structure of the NOC router we have discussed, it is not possible to forward two packets in the same output port. In this case, we have to pick one from P1 or from P2. Under this context, some works have been done wherein at this particular point, you give preference to a flit of P1. In the next clock cycle, you give preference to a flit of P2. That is called the round robin approach. Or the second approach is, rather than giving a round robin priority, one of these packets, say P1 or P2, is being picked based upon the age. How old these packets are there in the NOC and the oldest one is being preferred. So, we have round robin scheduling policy and the age based scheduling policy, which are the conventional scheduling policies. Now, what are the problems associated with this scheduling policy? They are going to treat all packets equally and they are not carrying any of the property of the application that triggered these packets. So, they are basically application oblivious. But we have to understand the fact that packets have different criticality. I would like to draw your attention to a new term known as criticality. Packets have different criticality. Now, what do you mean by a critical packet? A packet is critical if the latency of a packet affects application's performance. So, I will rephrase it. A packet is said to be critical if the latency of a packet is going to affect the application performance. So, we have a packet that is traveling through the network. If the packet is taking more time in the network, that means it is having more latency, then more latency is going to incur more performance degradation, then the packet is critical. There may be some packet, even if they take slightly more latency, it may not impact the application at all. So, in that case, the packet is not critical. So, criticality is basically associated with how much sensitive the application is with respect to the arrival time of this packet. So, a packet, if delayed, is going to affect the application, then we call the packet as critical. On the other case, if a packet's arrival at a node is not going to affect the overall stall time of the application, then we call it as a non-critical packets. 
and why we get criticality why packets are having different criticality different criticality of packets is due to the concept of memory level parallelism now we will try to understand the concept of memory level parallelism consider the previous split up where we have used for the cache memory consider the case where we have a tcmp system that is been shown in the diagram where we have close to 4 gb of physical memory main memory and we have a cache memory with 2 power 15 sets and these 2 power 15 sets are distributed across 64 core by the static nuca principle and this is the hexadecimal address we have shown so this address if it is generated by a core it is going to generate a packet to core number 44 similarly any change in the address will generate a packet to some other cores as well now we have to understand that this core is uh, going to generate three different cache misses let's say the first miss is the green color you can see that the green miss is mapped on to this particular core so while we doing the split up it so happened that the number in this 6 bit is corresponding to this core so there is a request that travel from this processing core into that particular destination and the data is brought back from there to the source core so we have to understand that this much time this is going to be the request and the reply time a packet started at this point is going to come back only at this point and that is called the latency of this green miss we can call this miss as green because that is the convention that is used here now the processor is going to work with the computation it is going to incur a different cache miss and that is for a blue color now we have to understand that this blue is marked on the top right corner so this time it is to a different destination so packet is going to move into this blue corner router that is being marked over there and the packet is going to come back so till it come back there is a stall that we are going to see from the application perspective so the blue packet has a latency and the application is going to stall for that much time now let us consider that there is one more miss with the red color that is mapped and that is going to uh, the bottom right corner and the packet goes all the way there and it is going to come back so this is a classical case where different addresses are going to create packets to different locations inside your tcmp and some may be to nearby locations and some may be to farther locations in all these cases the amount of stalling that the application had is more or less dependent on the latency the number of the more number of hopes the misses travel more is going to be the stall of the corresponding application now consider the case that you have to do three tasks and the tasks are being defined something like a is equal to x plus y so you have to consider in this case let's say you have to process an image and the image is obtained by getting two images x and y you are going to fuse some image or some task where you require a data of x as well as data of y and then the second step b is equal to a plus q and the third step c equal to b plus e what is the peculiarity if you carefully watch these three tasks what is the peculiarity of these three tasks the second task you can see that it is dependent on the first task and the third task is dependent on the second task so i cannot start processing the second task without completion of the first task so the first task is going to produce a result in a only if i get a then only i can process with uh, the q similarly the third task can be done only after completion of the second task let us try to understand these two in terms of an NOC context you're going to start your computation you are not having the values of X and Y with you so you are going to generate cache misses and these misses are going to travel through the network all the way to destination core and then the data is being brought back so by this time you got your X and Y ready by which I can compute the value of A so A is essentially computed at this point now you have to understand that while 
the cache miss is in progress since the processor cannot do anything the processor was in the waiting stage for this much amount of time now after the computation phase now i got a value of a but this q is not available so there is one more miss that happens all the way and uh, you are going to bring the value of q and once you get it you can compute b so processor is going to wait as a stall until q is obtained now again when you work on it you don't have the e with you so e is going to have one more miss and based upon that you are going to create this e also here so you get the value of e this is the context in which this application run now which of this stall we can see that the processor is having three different stalls one for the green miss one for the blue miss and one for the red miss out of these three stalls which one is critical we have defined the concept of criticality before a packet is said to be critical if it is going to affect the stall time of the application so if the green stall is reduced or if the packet that is going to bring the data correspond to exam by the green component if you reduce that stall time will reduce similarly if you can reduce the blue stall again its benefit so we can tell that these are the latencies of these three packets and packet latency is approximately equal to the network stall time the amount of time that the processor is stalling is roughly equal to the packet latency so whenever there is the packet in transit or it is there in the network the processor is stalling actually there is no overlap of misses so i can tell that all these misses will stall the application or rather i can tell the criticality of green and criticality of blue as well as the criticality of red is more or less equal every uh, miss what we have seen now all the three misses are critical because any delay in servicing these misses is going to impact the application the application is going to get stalled now let us revisit the example with a different set of a task i request you to kindly go through these three or four tasks rather four tasks that is given a equal to x plus y b equal to p plus q and c equal to m plus n and s is equal to b plus c what is the peculiarity when compared to the previous task that has been already mentioned we know that the first three tasks are mutually independent the green line the blue line as well as the red line can be carried out parallelly but the black line the fourth one can be done or can be processed only if the second and the third values are available so in this case if it is out of order super scalar processor whenever you don't have the value of x and y you just look into the adjacent line x and y so proper steps are initiated to bring x and y it's a non blocking cache i hope you are familiar with what is the terminology called non blocking cache whenever there is a miss in progress the processor can still service hits or there can be more number of misses and this is been handled by miss service holding registers so when the processor has generated a request for bringing x and y it can look to the adjacent instruction and p and q also you can go through and p and q is also a miss it is not there with you so one more request is generated to bring p and q and similarly you can go and find out m and n as well and then you reach a point where further you cannot do because without getting b and c you cannot process so this is the case that is been depicted here during the computation phase you are incurring with a miss because you are using out of order super scalar processor you could look into the adjacent instruction and it's a non blocking cache so you have had a green miss and a blue miss and a red miss so whenever you have a green miss processor is not stopping processor is going to work on adjacent independent instruction that can be fetched and executed since it is a non blocking cache the cache miss service is in progress again you incur one more miss it's a non blocking cache so caches can still work on it and then you reach the point where after the third miss you cannot find out any other instruction that can be operated at this point and then you are going to stall so the first stalling over once you get back the green and then you do some kind of a computation that is there so the value of a is computed essentially there and then you got the red packet back and then still you are waiting for this blue miss and then you do the last step this is basically the last step 
Luckily, we can see that there is no red bars in this. The, the processor is not waiting for the misses that are triggered by the red packet. Why it has happened? There was a miss that occurred. The red packet came back. So now we can see that the latency of green, the latency of blue, as well as the latency of the red. Here, there is no stall with respect to the red packet. So packet latency is not equal to network stall time. There are, so you can see that even though the green has started at this point, this is going to be the latency of the green packet, but processor is waiting only in this much time for the green packet. The remaining time, the processor is still in the computation phase. So just because you have a cache miss, processor need not be in the stalled condition. Processor may be still working on some other data, which is independent of the missed data. That is what we can see that the packet latency component is not equal to network stall time when we have non-blocking cache and out of order superscalar processor. So this means that different packets have different criticality due to memory level parallelism. Just because the cache misses are overlapped, we can see that the cache misses of green, blue and red are overlapped and red is completely contained inside blue. Red is coming back to the processor, maybe the red is mapped to a nearby tile, that's why the miss to that tile is going to return faster. So red is coming a little bit early. So red is not at all critical. So in that case, we can see that the red is less critical, whereas green and blue are more critical than the red. So we were trying to understand the concept of memory level parallelism from the perspective of overlapping cache misses and this can happen only if the processor is superscalar, out of order superscalar processor at the same time using non-blocking caches. Now we try to understand the concept of a slack of a packet. So slack of a packet is defined as the number of cycles a packet can be delayed inside a router without reducing the application performance. So what is the source of slack? It's basically memory level parallelism. So latency of an application's packet is hidden from the application due to overlap with latency of pending cache miss request. So what we have to do? Essentially, it's called prioritization of lower slack. So to re-emphasize the concept, we are trying to introduce a new concept called slack of a packet. Slack of a packet is defined as the number of cycles a packet can be delayed in the network without causing applications performance. So we have slack for those packets which are critical. If a packet is critical, I cannot delay it. So critical packet has a slack zero, whereas non-critical packet may have some slack. And memory level parallelism is a source for having slack. So some packets may return early than necessary. So what we are trying to do is rather than working for the conventional switch scheduling policies like age-based switch scheduling or round-robin based switch scheduling, it is always better to go and exploit the concept of slack. So if the slack value is recorded inside a packet, whenever two packets come together, we have to prioritize that packet with a lower slack. So trying to understand the concept of A equal to X plus Y, again, this is the instruction window that has been shown there. Let us say your computation phase and there is a load miss that happens and it is to this further core that has been shown. And then we are going to have the second miss, so one for the green value x and second one is a blue value y. So y is to the nearby core and uh, y is going to return early and then comes green. So you can see that to carry out a task A, you require both the values of x and y. x comes a bit late. You incurred a miss on the value x as well as on y. x came a bit late because the address in which x is mapped is very far with respect to the source core under consideration and the address to which y is mapped is rather very close to the tile under consideration. So you have x plus y and then we are going to compute. So this is the latency of the blue packet as well as the latency of the green packet and we know that the blue packet returns earlier than necessary. There is no problem even if this blue packet is going to return at this point. It, there is no stall that is going to happen because the application is going to stall for the green packet. If the blue packet is going to return at this point, then there is going to be a blue stalling that happens. So as long as the blue packet is going to return somewhere in this region, it is not going to affect the performance. 
That means blue packets can be delayed. That is what is known as the slack of blue. So the slack of blue packet is defined as the latency of the green packet minus the latency of blue packet. Now in this context, let me define the latency in terms of hopes. You can see that the green packet has to travel all the way 13 hopes in one direction and 13 hopes in another direction, thereby making total of 26 hopes the green packet has to travel in terms of request as well as reply. But the blue has to travel only 3 hopes onward and 3 hopes return. So that makes only 6 hopes that it is going to travel. So the green packet has to travel 26 hopes, whereas the blue packet will travel only 6 hopes, leading to a slack of 20 hopes that is available with the blue. Meaning, the blue packet can be delayed to a time equal to that of 20 hopes. This is because blue has a predecessor that is traveling to farther distance in the TCMP. So packet blue can be delayed for available slack cycles without reducing the performance. That is the way how we look these things up. Now, how are we going to exploit the slack? Consider now two applications, core A as well as core B. So this is the place where A is running and this is the place where B is running. Let us say A is going to generate two misses, the blue and the green. And you can see that where is blue mapped and where is green mapped. Similarly, the second one is going to have a red miss as well as the lighter green miss. And this is also going to two similar places. And then if you look at the slack of this packet, the green packet does not have a slack because it is not having a predecessor. So slack of green is 0. Whereas grac of blue is that uh, it is going to be 10 uh, uh, because the predecessor for blue, green is traveling longer. So blue can be delayed by 10 hopes. When you come to this gray, it is not having a slack because that is traveling to a longer distance. Whereas the red is traveling shorter distance, so red has slack. Now we can understand that uh, these are the points where the both the red flit as well as the green flit are going to interfere each other. So these two packets are going to interfere at three hopes. So when you have a green packet coming from the north looking for the south output port and you have the red packet that is coming from the west looking for the south output port. These things happen in this router. So you have a green packet that is going to come from the north and looking for south and you have a red packet that is coming from the west and they both are looking for the south output port. Both are looking for the south output port. So the conventional policy say it can be based on age or it can be based on round robin. And now what we are going to look is, we are going to look at the slack of the packets. If the slack of the packet is already recorded, then we can see that the slack of red is greater than that of slack of the green packet. So that means green can have priority because delaying green is going to affect the application whereas delaying red will not affect the application because red is having a slack. So the whole idea that we learned just now is trying to represent the slack of a packet inside a packet and when the packet is traveling through various intermediate routers everywhere if the slack based prioritized routing can be done. This is known as slack aware routing for applications. Now let us try to understand another problem of network congestion and how so research work proposed in this domain have addressed this issue. Try to see what is network congestion here. We have packets that is starting from various processing elements and all of them are coming to one point. So there are too many packets in the router buffer leading to a scenario where the locally created packets, you see the LO packet cannot make any progress. LO packet cannot make any progress because injection is suppressed. So naturally scenarios like this where packets cannot be injected into the network due to the heavy traffic in the network, it is going to degrade problem. So network congestion degrades the system performance. That is what the take. Now network congestion management, how can you manage? So how will you improve system performance in a highly congested network? That is a goal. So this can be done with a concept called reducing the network load. How can you reduce network load? What is load in the network? 
when a packet is coming to network that is called a load so how will you reduce the load you have to reduce the number of packets but packets are essentially triggered by cache misses you cannot reduce cache miss just by working on the network so what we are trying to do is the number of packets in the network decreases network congestion and hence improve performance so based upon that the uh, work is already been proposed by so research groups and one of that one is called source throttling so we are trying to understand what is called the concept of source throttling source throttling is a technique where packets are temporarily delayed it's only a temporary delay to injection so let's say you are going to inject at clock cycle number 10 i won't permit the packet to be injected at clock cycle number 10 it is slightly delayed to clock cycle number say 12 or 14 or 20 so the whole idea of managing congestion by packet throttling is some of the applications are been carefully chosen based upon certain characteristic of the application and delaying those applications in injecting packets into the network so consider a scenario you have lot of processing elements and these processing elements are going to generate packets when they encounter cache misses and let's say there are a lot of packets in the network this is a logical view of the underlying noc so when there are too many packets in the network it is going to have long network latency when the packet is congested so what we can do is we are going to throttle throttle means don't allow all the packets to enter into the network so once you apply the throttling technique packets are getting queued up you can see that packets are getting queued up in the processing elements and the number of packets in the network has substantially reduced that gives to a slightly easy path so throttling makes some packets wait longer to inject average network throughput increases hence it will give to higher performance so whenever there are a lot of packets in the network we cannot move through the network so when some of the packets are be delayed then that will lead to less amount of traffic in the network leading to better performance so i would like to draw your attention to a common life example let us say you are living in a city and uh, you know that evening say 3 o'clock the schools school time ends and lot of school workers are going to come out from the school so in and around a school in a city there is going to be some heavy congestion so the number of workers in the road is relatively high during uh, the closing time of a school lot of school vans and parents who have come to pick up the children are all going to be there in the road now you just imagine a scenario you are a third person you are passing through nearby place of the school so when you travel around 3 o'clock maybe you may take 1 hour to reach the destination rather than traveling at 3 o'clock now let's say you travel at 3:30 that's the time when you pass through the school nearby vicinity of the school you may not experience that much congestion so you could reach the destination in 30 minutes so when you travel at 3 o'clock you may take 1 hour to reach a destination but when you travel at 3:30 you may reach only 30 minutes to reach a destination why this context that particular time there were too much packets in the network so if you also go there you may also get delayed so the policy that we use is rather than going into the traffic at some point we are delaying them to certain clock cycles that is essentially the idea of throttling now let us try to work on some example so consider you have a 4 by 4 mesh network which is going to have 16 applications so when you have 4 by 4 mesh network you have talking about a 16 tile tcmp let us say out of the 16 tiles in eight of the tiles an application a is running and in eight of the tiles application b is running the peculiarity of a is a is network non intensive so a is a light application and b is a network intensive application or b is going to be a heavy application so this is a scenario you have an application a and application b a is going to be a network non intensive light application so you can see that the number of packets by a is rather less whereas the number of packets by b is going to be relatively on the higher side now if you throttle a then hardly very few packets are reduced in the network it is not going to affect 
the performance of A. Rather, since the most important packets of A are being throttled, you may degrade the system performance. So, throttling A decreases system performance due to minimal network load reduction. Rather than that, now throttling of B, you just consider I am going to throttle B, then there is sufficient number of packet reduction. So, throttling B increases system performance due to the reduced congestion. So, the takeaway is throttling a network intensive application lead to higher system performance. So, when you have multiple applications running on a TCMP, it is not like arbitrarily we pick one of the tile and then trying to throttle. Essentially, you have to find out which is a network intensive application, that application which pump in too many packets into the network and throttle them. So, which application to throttle is really an important question that we have to answer. So, consider this configuration, we have a 16 node system where 8 of them are network non-intensive and 8 of them are network intensive. So, this is an example of a network non-intensive application called Gromax, it is taken from spec benchmark. And this is another example of an application which is called the MCF that is a network intensive application. So, throttling B is going to reduce congestion and A gets benefit more from getting the, so the network non-intensive application. So, once in a while only, once in a while only they are going to generate packets and these packets will get a easy route because B is throttled, it is not A that gets throttled. So, there is no single throttling rate that works well for every application workload. So, you have many applications like this like what I have mentioned from the spec benchmark, if you throttle one of them, you get less benefit, whereas if you throttle the other, you are going to get more benefit. So, network runs best at or below a certain network load. So, we have to adjust the throttling rate or how much to throttle to avoid overload and underutilization scenario. Now, what do you mean by application aware throttling? Because every application has their own network intensiveness, which we cannot define early. During different phases of execution, certain applications may be network intensive for the first 1 lakh cycles and may not be network intensive for the next 1 lakh cycles. So, we have to continuously uh, monitor these applications and try to come up with a parameter which will define whether the application should be throttled or not. So, we have to measure the network intensity of the application and one such parameter is called MPKI, it is called misses per kilo instruction. So, use L1 MPKI misses per kilo instruction to estimate network intensity and throttle network intensive application. So, how are you going to compute? So, essentially we have to find out number of cache misses that each of the tile is going to generate, record it maybe in a hardware counter and try to exchange these values to some central controller. So, every tile may be associated with some counters. Whenever there is a packet that is generated into the network, these counters are updated and once in a while at regular intervals, these counter values are being collected and try to find out which of these tile is, go, is generating more number of misses, and take up some conclusion and report it back to them. So, applications are non-intensive, meaning if the MPKI of the application is less than a threshold and applications are called as network intensive if the MPKI is larger than a threshold. So, the non-intensive applications are not throttled whereas, network intensive applications are throttled. So, how will you perform application aware throttling? We have to classify applications. So, application classification and throttling rate adjustments are expensive if it is done on every cycle. So, we cannot look for whether every core is injecting more or less at all the cycles. So, we need to define a time window during the time period the network is trying to learn what happens. We are trying to analyze what happens in the network by setup by virtue of setting up some extra hardware units and for a reasonable time window once we understand the behavior of network then initiate appropriate corrections mechanism. So, solution is you recompute at fixed time interval granularity what is going to be. So, what happens for example in this research work the authors have found that you watch for a period of 100k clock cycles. So, during the epoch, every node is going to measure this L1 MPKI and it is also going to measure the network load 
at the end of this say 100k clock cycles, all nodes send the measured information to a central controller which classify the application based upon L1 MPKI and find out what should be the rate of throttling. So let us say a tile 1, it is pumping so many packets, so throttle at 0.8. Tile 2, it is not generating much packets, so tile 2 is not throttled. Tile 3, it is also pumping a reasonable amount of packets, maybe throttling at 0 0.4. So if you have 64 tiles or if you have 128 tiles, this controller is going to get the amount of traffic all these tiles are going to generate into the network and this traffic is studied, come up with a threshold parameter. Those who are generating packets above this threshold, these tiles are being informed back by some control messages to reduce the injection. So these are the cores which are getting throttled. The other cores are not throttled. So it is application based throttling. Some of the tiles are throttled, some of the tiles are not throttled. So that is the way how the whole concept of application aware throttling is going to work. Now we have learned about two concepts. One is based on applications property you root. Second one based on applications network intensiveness you prohibit them or deny them injection into the network. So slack aware routing is what we discussed once and second one is packet throttling. Now let us move into another area which is called application to core mapping. We know that we have a lot of applications that we use on a day to day basis and we are going to work on smartphones or tablets which are having many cores. Now the question is which application is going to map to which core. Daily we work on applications like WhatsApp, your Facebook, your news feed, your movie playing your calculators, your alarm, all these are going to be different apps that are going to run on a tiled chip multi-core system. Now where will my WhatsApp application run? Will, will my WhatsApp application run on core number 1 or core number 2 or core number 100? Where will my Google Chrome application will run? Where will my banking application will run? So it is now we are trying to look from a slightly upper level perspective, the job that is done by an operating system in finding out the appropriate core for an application to run and that is been termed as application to co core mapping policies. So how to map applications to cores? Application to core mapping, today we are going to discuss about uh, four different application to core mapping techniques. One is called clustering, other one is balancing, third one is isolation and the fourth one is radial mapping. This is also taken from the literature, from the recent published works. So what about task scheduling? So in operating system, task scheduling is a very common term, which tells when you have multiple tasks and when you have one processor, it will basically tell when to schedule a task. I will repeat once again, when you have many tasks or many process, P1, P2, P3, P4, and I have only one processor which process will run on the processor that is called temporal scheduling, when to schedule a task. When you move into multi-core systems like our chip multi-core system TCMP, we have now two design issues. Apart from temporal scheduling, when to schedule a task, you have one more problem to solve like where to schedule a task and that is called spatial scheduling. So spatial scheduling impacts the performance of memory hierarchy and the latency of an application is dependent on spatial scheduling. If an application runs on core number 2, let us say it is generating a miss all the way to core number 60, it has to travel a lot, so the latency of the packet is very high. Rather than scheduling the application on core number 2, had it been scheduled at core number 60, then 60 to 63 is a shorter distance, so the latency of the same application is going to vary because the application itself is scheduled on a different core. So what are the challenges in spatial task scheduling? First we have to find out how a scheduling is going to impact the communication distance, how it will reduce communication distance. A tile is communicating with some other tile in forms of packets. Sometimes if you carefully schedule, then the communication distance can be reduced. How to reduce destructive interference between application? One application can impact with some other application's packet or packets from two different applications may reach at the same junction and both may be wanting to look for 
the same output port. So one is going to stop the other. How that can be reduced? And third one, how to prioritize applications to improve the throughput? So let us try to learn one by one. If the first application to core mapping is called the clustering. Consider a TCMP where you can see that the memory controllers are kept in the corner tiles. Let's say there is an application that runs here. Now this application is going to have a memory footprint which are going to incur L2 misses to these, these cores. So this application is going to generate packet into these cores and some of these packets are coming like this. So you are getting a wide range of cores to which these memory mappings are done. So this is an inefficient data mapping to memories and caches because this applications packet will travel all the way to network and it is going to affect the performance of other applications as well. One way of mitigating this is you are going to divide the network into multiple clusters and make sure that the physical address assigned to this application's data is organized in such a way that they are mapping only to that cluster. So we know what are the tile numbers for this cluster. And from the address that we have, we have a tag portion, we have an index portion and we have an offset portion. So from the address that we have, if you carefully give indexes, then we can make sure that once they are coming into the tiles, they are mapped to nearby locations or into the same cluster. This actually reduces the latency of the misses generated by the application and reduces its interference with packets generated by other applications from other clusters also. This will improve your locality. So there will be some other application which are strictly mapped into that core. So operating system plays or your Android that is going to run on the cell phones. So this operating system is going to run, is have a very, very crucial role, an important role that governs the performance. So where you schedule a task is very important. So it will reduce the interference. How it is possible? It's locality aware page replacement policy. So when you bring a data from the secondary memory and put it in main memory, you are going to assign an address. The moment we give a space to an instruction or a data inside the main memory or inside your DRAM, its physical address is fixed. And it is a portion of the physical address is the index. We know that the physical address is split into tag, index and offset. So certain bits in the physical address is coming as your index and in a TCMP, certain bits of your set index is nothing but your destination core. So destination core should be given those addresses carefully such that it, it result in locality. So when we allocate free page, give preference to pages belonging to the clusters, memory controllers only. These are the way how clustering can be done. Now other mapping technique is called balancing. We have different applications. Some applications are heavy. This is very heavy. This is still heavy. And some applications are light. This is based upon the number of packets these applications are going to inject into the network. Now consider the case that if you map the applications like this, all the heavy applications are in one core and all the lighter applications are in other core. Essentially, we can see that this particular core is mapped with applications which are relatively very heavy. Consider the case that you are going to work with your WhatsApp application and a video player. Let's say these are the very heavy used application in your cell phone. If these two applications are mapped in one location, maybe in one cluster, and the other clusters are relatively of less use, then the activity factor in the cluster is going to be very high. So when you have heavy applications mapped in one of the clusters, the amount of network activity, the amount of cache activity, the amount of work done by the processor is heavy, it lead to uneven wear and tear. Physical activity is very high there. So that is not a good approach. So the best approach in this context can be, we have to come up with solutions in such a way that too much load on a cluster with heavy applications. This will lead to early dying of the chips because certain portions of the chips are very heavily used. It's as good as like our normal traffic roads. Certain roads where there is heavy traffic, it is prone to more wear and tear and that can lead to damage of the roads. 
whereas if certain roads are not heavily used they may be having less damage so in order to increase the lifespan of chips it's always better to map applications to this chip in such a way that every area of the chip is being fairly used so how balancing can be done you should have applications in all the clusters such that we have a right mix of heavy as well as light applications so this is called better bandwidth utilization now can we improve upon this further so there is another operation that is called sensitive certain applications are going to be sensitive sensitive means these are the applications which will generate misses only once in a while and these misses are very very important these misses need to be serviced very fast so they don't want to meet with the traffic of others like for example when vvip so our ministers are traveling through our road they don't want to wait for others they don't uh, want to get their vehicles delayed so the convoy or the security make sure that these are all sensitive traffic very sensitive traffic they cannot afford a delay so all others are being blocked so in such kind of context it is always preferred to map the sensitive applications into one cluster and map the remaining clusters with a fair mix of heavy as well as light applications so thereby we make sure that sensitive applications are not interfering with other non sensitive applications so certain area can be reserved for sensitive applications such that their performance is not impacted by the presence of others and the rest of the area can be filled with the right mix of heavy as well as uh, light applications now how will you estimate sensitivity that's a crucial design question when you have high number of misses it has been defined with the help of mpki so mpki define the application have the number of misses per kilo instruction and when you have low memory level parallelism so you have misses and for each miss there is high relative stall time an application is to be sensitive if the mpki is greater than threshold and relative stall time per miss or stall cycles per miss is very high so it generates so many misses and these misses are not overlapping so the stall cycles is very less such applications are going to be sensitive so whether to or not to allocate clusters to sensitive application is a design issue now the last work that we are going to see today is radial mapping so what we try to do is we have different applications here some are heavy some are light now we know that the heavy applications incur more number of misses more packets so they are moving into l2 cache tiles they come back and the probability that they may miss in the l2 also is very high so they may some of these misses generated by heavy application can go to the memory controllers so what we can do is map applications that benefit most from being close to memory controllers keep them close to the memory that's a way by which first you keep the isolated or the sensitive applications then the heavy applications are put near to the memory controller and then relatively light applications close to the sender and the light applications are put it in the sender so the idea is very simple heavy applications are mapped to let's say corner or the edge routers the heavy one then the medium intensive ones and the light ones and then you apply it across all the cores so this makes sure that the sender of the tile is having applications which are relatively of less network activity and the edges and corners are having applications with high network activity now put it all together for performance what we have seen we have clustering we have balancing and isolation that takes care of inter cluster mapping and then we learned about the radial mapping that is called intra cluster mapping so all together they are going to improve your locality it will reduce the interference and it will improve the shared resource utilization so these are the things that we discussed today just to summarize today's lecture we started our discussion with looking into application level parameters that is called trying to understand and define 
terminology called slack and memory level parallelism find out slack of a packet slack of a packet is dependent on how far the predecessor packets have traveled and embed the slack value in the packets and that's why we do slack aware routing and then we find out the intensity of network usage network intensive applications are throttled and then we have seen what is the role played by operating system in spatial scheduling where which will tell you where an application is kept in a tcmp so this gives a total picture so there are certain things that we can work at the hardware level by modifying the micro architecture that is why application aware routing slack aware routing and all so all these are changes that we make at the micro architecture level at the cache memory level at the noc level such that application performance is improved and towards the end we have seen what is the role played by the operating system in properly mapping certain applications into certain cores so altogether we have seen that if you make certain small changes both at the hardware level and at the operating system level then the quality of service offered by nocs and cache can be improved so with this we come to the end of uh, this quality of service experience and there are few tutorials that are been put up problem sheets i request you to just to go through these problem sheets and get yourself then familiarized with this course so with this i conclude today's lecture thank you